Thank you, Angel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I won't do too too much of an intro about myself. But I'll just mention that um, I first really loved plants, and then my senior year of of undergraduate um, school, I took an entomology class and really fell in love with insects. Um, and so for my master's, I studied forest entomology. Um, I studied bark beetles, which we'll actually be talking about a little bit later. Um, and, and then after grad school, um, I worked at a nature center and I would see fungi all the time. And that's when I really fell in love with fungi. And so I love a chance to kind of blend some of my interests and talk about the relationships between um, my interests. And so um, today I get to talk about fungus and insect interactions, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, before we get into um, specific interactions, I wanted to talk about a little bit of the evolutionary history of, of uh, fungi. So fungi have been on land for at least 635 to 500 million years ago. Um, there's some research out there that talks about even up to a billion years ago. Um, but we can agree at least that plants have been on land longer than, or sorry, fungi have been on land longer than plants. So current estimates for plants are that they started coming onto land around 500 to 440 million years ago. Um, and Merlin Sheldrake actually has a, a quote uh, talking about how um, before there were even roots, um, fungi were helping plants. I'm, I'm not saying the quote exactly, but basically fungi were helping plants um, extract minerals from the soil, things like that, before there were even roots. So liverworts, for example, were some of the early plants that were forming relationships with fungi and roots hadn't even um, evolved in those early plants yet. Um, and all this to say, um, insects evolved around 480 million years ago. Um, and so they were coming onto land around that time. And there was probably a lot more fungus on land at the time than there were plants. Um, and so <clears throat> presumably we can assume that insects almost immediately as they started to evolve, started to form relationships with fungi, whether it was just um, eating fungi or some of the more complex relationships started to, to form um, even as you know early as 400 million years ago. Um, as far as we know, certain specific relationships happened not necessarily 400 million years ago, but fungus farming um, started 35 to 60 million years ago. Um, and uh, now we have 240 species of ants at least that farm fungi. Um, termites and beetles farm fungi as well, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and kind of in that same time frame, we know that entomopathogenic fun fungi, the zombie ant fungi, um, existed at least 48 million years ago. Um, and so the reason I wanted to talk about this is just to talk about how um, insects and fungi have been uh, interacting for a really long time. And there's a lot of generalist insects um, who eat fungi, but there's a lot of specialist insects that eat fungi as well. Um, so here's a list of some of the families, subfamilies, or genera that are highly associated with fungi. In fact, they're, the common names of these family, subfamilies, or genera have the word fungus in the name. So um, pleasing fungus beetles, for example, have um, over 600 species within that family. Um, and so um, just looking at this list here, um, you can imagine just how many species are specialized um, with fungi. Um, and then I kind of did the same thing, species associated with fungi. So this is, these are, this is going to the species level. So, um, and part of the reason I wanted to do this is because some of these have such uh, fun names. Uh, I love the diabolical fungus moth, um, but there's all kinds of, of uh, 
really specialized insects that feed on fungi. Okay, so now let's kind of go into the good, the bad, and the ugly, starting with the good. Um, first, we're going to talk about crypsis and camouflage in insects and how that might relate to fungi. Then we'll talk about spore spreaders um, and then fungus farmers and decomposers. Um, okay, so here is a spiny leaf insect that is um, over time evolved to look very much like lichens. Um, lichens are a symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae and other um, things as well sometimes. Um, and you can see that uh, this insect looks very much like the lichens on that stick that it's climbing on. Um, and there's all kinds of insects that mimic lichens. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of insects spend their life on sticks, trunks of trees, things like that. Um, and if they want to blend in, um, it's beneficial for them to evolve patterns that are similar to what they're they're spending most of their time on. So um, there's moths, um, mantids, beetles, all kinds of insects that have evolved patterns to look like lichens. Um, and then there's an insect that not just looks like a lichen, but actually takes bits of lichen and covers itself with it. Um, and so this is a green lacewing larva. Um, if you've had your lights on um, at night and seen these little green insects with clear wings flying around your lights at night, that's a green lacewing adult. Um, but as larvae, they are these little predatory um, uh, insects with big mandibles. Um, and in and, and this species, it takes little bits of lichen and has it on a cover on its back. And that allows it to um, have protection from ants or other things that might be interested in eating it. Meanwhile, it can go around and munch on aphids, um, which is what one of their most common food sources. Um, another thing about insects, and this um, goes, this is speaking for specialist insects and generalist insects, but basically any of the insects that are eating fungi are spreading spores. So they're usually, you know, walking on the fungus or, um, or they're passing those spores through their gut, but either way they are spreading spores. So here's some examples of specialist um, insects, the marbled fungus weevil and the poor spotted fungus beetle. Both of these were seen on the same tree. It was a legestrum, um, a dead legestrum covered in, in fungi, which of course we love to see, at least here in Texas. Um, okay, and then here's some other examples of insects um, on the undersides of mushrooms. Clearly they're um, picking up spores that way. Um, and can spread them elsewhere. So on the far left, we've got uh, a panis species of mushroom, and there's a row of beetles tucked in in the gills of that mushroom. Um, in the middle, we've got uh, the hexagonal pored polypore, the Neophobolus brasiliensis, I believe. And there's some calembola um, or springtails on the underside of it. And then um, it's kind of hard to tell actually both the species of mushroom and insects on the far right. Um, looks like a beetle for sure. And um, I'm not sure what that other insect is. It's just not a great, I tried zooming in and everything, but um, you know, you have to have a macro lens to, to get a good picture of some of these insects. Um, but all this to say is that these insects are, are not only feeding on mushrooms and, and that's interesting enough, but they're also spreading the spores. Um, here's a, another specialist, um, the forked fungus beetle. Um, and I can't find this in the literature, but I think that it's mimicking, it's that warty texture is mimicking um, caterpillar frass. Frass is a fancy word for insect poop. Um, and if you've ever seen caterpillar frass, it looks a lot like these beetles here. Um, the males have these horns um, and males, uh, mate guard 
um, by standing on females. So basically they're trying to prevent other males from mating with her by just standing on her. And once she's ready to mate, she'll signal to him in some way and then they can mate. Um, these beetles spend their entire lives around fungi. So both as adults and um, as larvae, um, and they typically feed on fomus species and Ganoderma species. Um, what I like too is that somebody uh, did a lot of research on these. Um, you know, there's plenty of really important stuff to do research on, but somebody found these important enough to, to do um, some studies on. Um, and so beetles use their pronotum, uh, these horns on their pronotum to kind of buck males off of females so that they can stand on the female and make guard her. Um, and so there's this really great illustration of that. Um, and then they also studied their grip strength. So they tied a little piece of twine around them and we're measuring just how much force it took to kind of pry them off because they must have great grip strength if they've evolved that um, uh, behavior of trying to stand on a female for as long as you can. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, I just think these are really kind of bizarre looking beetles and really interesting. They're tenebrionids, which are the uh, darkling beetles, um, and they're pretty unique looking for that family. They don't look like a lot of the, the other members of that family. Um, fungus gnats, uh, there's actually several families of fungus gnats. Um, this is a picture of the dark winged fungus gnat on, um, on witch's butter. And um, their larvae are typically what's feeding on fungi, um, but they'll hang around it to mate or to lay eggs. Um, here's uh, another dark winged fungus gnat. This one flew into a light. Uh, at night, and I was doing some light trapping. Um, and then here is a member of a different family. This is a predatory fungus gnat. Um, and predatory fungus gnats, um, most of them eat fungi, but then they'll also eat um, other insects um, or other small uh, creatures in the soil or in fungi. Um, in fact, one really cool uh, type of fungus gnat uh, or predatory fungus gnat is um, the glowworms that you could see in Australia or New Zealand. Um, they're actually in that same family and they'll hang out in caves. They um, produce, produce a strand of silk with all these little sticky beads of liquid on them and they glow and insects are attracted to the glowing and they fly around and they get stuck in those uh, strands of silk. And then the larva will pull up the the silk and eat whatever insect got caught in it. Um, so definitely like a bucket list item for me to one day visit one of those caves where those strands of silk are just dangling and there's the glowing uh, insects on, on top. Um, but perhaps my most uh, favorite fact about fungus gnats is that gnat is short for Matthew. Um, couldn't help but include that. Um, Okay, and then uh, here's a video that I took of a stink horn, and you can see some maggots in there of the of fungus gnat. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with stink horns, um, stink horns are in a family of fungi called Phalaceae. Um, and um, looking at the root word of that, you can you can guess why. Um, they also the as the common name suggests, they smell. Um, to most people, you would they would probably say it smells bad, um, but it attracts flies, um, beetles, fungus gnats, um, potentially even larger animals. Um, I know you know my dogs have been curious about the smells whenever they whenever we come across one on the trail, um, and all of these animals. Uh, basically can become spreaders of those spores. Uh, their spores are in this kind of gooey liquid mass called gleba. Um, it's the brown mass that you're seeing in some of these. And um, that can easily get picked up on um, parts of whatever animal um, is interested in it, smelling it, touching it in any way. And then the animal 
you know, spreads it as it goes on its way and, and lands somewhere else or, or walks somewhere else. Um, and so various insects, uh, including a lot of insects that aren't specialized in mushrooms, basically get tricked into coming to this fungus and then spreading its spores. Okay, and then we're going to talk a little bit about fungus farming. So leafcutter ants are fungus farmers. They're not actually eating the leaves. They're cutting up leaves to feed to a fungus in their nest. Um, and so they have chambers in their nest where they're growing fungi, and then they feed on that fungi. Um, and uh, there's a ton of interesting information about leafcutter ants. Um, so uh they have all kinds of enzymes and and you know antibacterial uh chemicals that they use because if you think about it they're bringing a lot of leaf material into their nest and there's all kinds of other things that could be growing on those leaves um other bacteria other fungi that want to eat those leaves and so they have to be very fastidious about inoculating um those leaves as quickly as possible so they eat these um, gongolidia, which grow on the fungus, um, and then they deposit it on top of the new, newly deposited of leaves uh, through a fecal droplet. Um, and so they're quickly inoculating all the new leaves with the fungus. Um, the fungus itself doesn't make any kind of mush mushroom or fruiting body. Um, these are just so specialized. Um, together with the ant that, you know, they basically rely on the ant to get spread around. Um, I'll go into a little more detail about that. So um, basically, um, all the workers in an ant colony are females. They're all daughters of the queen. Um, so they're all related as well. Um, and um, Every once in a while, the queen produce, produces reproductives, and those could be both males and females. The males don't really do anything except uh, want to mate with females. The females, um, uh, they have to start their, their own new colony. So what they do is they grab a little piece of the fungus from the fungus garden, and then they go on a nuptial flight. So both the males and females um, have wings. Um, so this female is carrying a little bit of fungus in her mandibles as she flies, and she'll mate with several males on her nuptial flight. Um, and then that'll be the only time in her life that she will mate. Um, and then she'll land, roll up her wings, and hopefully she found a decent spot to, to start excavating a nest. She'll deposit the fungus, start laying eggs, and hopefully quickly have daughters that can help farm the fungus. Um, and that's kind of basically the, the way that this fungus is proliferated just by, you know, reproductive females carrying it in their mandibles into new places and then um, taking care of it and, you know, creating more daughters to help uh, care for this fungus. There's also fungus far farming termites. Um, they're all in Macrotermidinae, um, a sub subfamily of termites. Um, and they all farm um, a species of Termitomyces. So Termitomyces is a genus of fungus, a mushroom forming fungus. You can see here, this is Termitomyces titanicus, one of the largest mushrooms in the world. Um, and so, Unlike the fungus that the ants are growing, these actually do make fruiting bodies. Um, I believe they're edible. I don't know about all Termitomyces, but I, I believe that Titanicus is. Um, and um, you should look up pictures of them because there's some really amazing pictures of just how big uh, these mushrooms can be. Um, yeah, I'll just move on from there. Let's see. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the bad. Um, we're gonna talk about plant pests and vectors of disease. Um, the first one is a pretty minor plant pest, um, the mushroom gall wasp. Um, for those unfamiliar with 
Um, oh, and before I, I continue talking about it, this isn't an actual mushroom. Um, this is a gall. Um, it just happens to look like an adorable little mushroom house. Um, so let me back up and explain what a gall is. Um, a gall is um, plant tissue that is formed around a developing insect. Um, in this case, a tiny wasp. Um, and so um, gall wasps, uh, basically adult gall wasps will lay an egg into a plant. Um, and either that female as she's laying the egg or as the insect is developing, it starts excreting um, chemicals that alter the plant tissue. Um, and so these will, um, for those of y'all in Texas, you've probably seen these on oak leaves. There's all kinds of diversity of galls. There's some that are fuzzy, there's some that are just round, um, and then there's some that look like a little, tiny little mushroom house. Um, and so this is a gall that just happens to look like a mushroom. It actually isn't a mushroom. And then as that insect um, continues to develop in there, it'll eventually pupate where it goes transformation between a larva into a, into an adult. And then it has to chew its way out, which is why this has a little exit hole and looks like a little house. Um, and I also mentioned that these aren't um, really a huge issue for plants. Um, so if you have galls on your oak tree, it's nothing to worry about. You don't want to, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend, you know, calling any kind of um, pest person to do anything about it because it's not doing enough harm to a tree to really um, warrant any kind of, uh, intervention at all. So um, certainly save your money and don't don't pay for things like this. Um, it's just a, an incredible natural part of ecology that you should be excited about instead. Um, okay, and then let's talk about bark beetles a little bit. Um, so bark beetles are uh, actually weevils. They're in Curculionidae um, and then the subfamily Scalidinae. Um, and if y'all have been to the Western US or Canada in recent years, you might've seen whole mountainsides that have been wiped out um, of certain trees. Um, and this is being done by tiny, tiny beetles that are native. Um, they're about the size of a grain of rice and um, their populations, not necessarily all bark beetles, but some, some bark beetle species, their populations fluctuate dramatically. Sometimes they're hardly detectable in a forest. And then for whatever reason, conditions are right and their populations will explode and um, they'll wipe out mountainsides of forests. Um, and, um, Pretty much all bark beetles have mutual relationships with fungi. Um, and in some cases, uh, the bark beetles, uh, we'll talk about ambrosia beetles here in a minute, but they sometimes exclusively feed on the fungi. So they just need to inoculate a tree with the fungus and then they eat the fungus that starts growing in the tree. Um, other ones, uh, just inoculate the wood and then they eat the wood and the fungus both. Um, the way that they kill the tree, by the way, is by overwhelming the tree, eating it on all sides. And what they're eating in typically is either xylem or phloem. Um, a lot of the dendroctinus, the ones in the West and in Canada, they're feeding in the phloem. And that basically is cutting off the flow of nutrients from the, from the needles of the tree to the roots. Um, and so that's what kills the tree typically. Um, and so this picture in the middle, you're seeing the galleries where they're feeding within the phloem. Um, the picture on the right is a pitch tube and that's pine sap um, that when the beetle was trying to chew its way into the tree, the tree was pushing out sap to try to engulf the beetle. Um, and sometimes it successfully does that. And sometimes the beetle keeps chewing its way through. Um, but that's a good way to detect whether or not a tree has 
has at least had beetles attempting to work their way into the phloem. Um, and pretty much all of these bark beetles, and especially ambrosia beetles, have mycangia. And mycangia are um, structures that hold spores um, and sometimes actual fungus itself. Um, and so these are the ways that they are transporting the fungus from tree to tree. Um, and so um, some of these are located near the mouths of insects, some are on their backs, um, and um, they actually have all these glands in their mycangia that support fungal growth. Um, and so while the, the fungus is on the insect, it's actually proliferating within that um, structure. And um, mites that actually live on some of these beetles have their own mycangia. For some reason on mites, it's not called mycangia. I think that they're called sporothecas, or there might be another name as well. Um, so they are sometimes carrying their own um, fungi as well. We're going to talk a little bit about oak weld. I'm not going to go into huge a huge amount of detail. As you all see later, uh, we're going to have a presentation on oak weld next month. Um, but nitidulid beetles um, can spread oak weld. Um, typically, what happens is a red oak gets infected with oak wilt. And um, under the bark of that red oak, a mat of fungus will form. And the bark will crack. And these nitidulid beetles, which are, they're not specialists, they're kind of more generalist um, beetles. They will smell this fungus, this fungal mat, and they'll find their way into those cracks. And they'll feed on the fungal mat, crawl around, they'll pick up the spores. And then um, they'll fly to another oak tree, um, a tree that might have some branch damage, or maybe it was recently pruned. Um, and they'll start feeding in that uh, wound and they'll spread the spores into that wound. Um, and then oak wilt can transfer into that tree. Um, and so here in Texas, they say to avoid pruning cuts from February 1st to July 1st, because that's when that fungal mat and beetle um, interaction is really happening. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, only the red oaks get the fungal mat. So um, if, it, if a live oak gets oak wilt, it won't develop a fungal mat. Um, and so the only way that um, the oak wilt will spread from live oak to live oak is through root grafts. Um, and so trees of the same species will often graft roots together. Um, so where you have um, dense live oaks and one of the live oaks gets oak wilt, usually what they have to do is they decide on a radius and they'll just trench, um, dig a trench, uh, cutting through all the roots within that uh, radius, um, assuming that all the trees immediately next to the tree that has oak wilt are probably already goners, um, but they can protect trees outside of that radius by trenching all the way around. Um, uh, there are some uh, potential ways to save these oaks, and I'm sure we'll hear about some of that uh, next month. But um, yeah. Um, sooty molds. So sooty molds uh, you'll see on leaves and they're not actually doing any damage to the leaf. It's or not immediate damage to the leaf. Um, they're actually um, molds that grow on honeydew. And so aphids and other sap feeding insects will produce a lot of waste that has a lot of sugar in it. And um, Sometimes the plants underneath the trees that they're feeding or whatever plant that they're feeding on will get covered in honeydew and then a fungus comes in and starts eating up that honeydew. Um, and if there's enough uh, honeydew that it starts to completely cover the leaves, then the, the plant 
can struggle because it's just not able to photosynthesize as well. It's not able to res respire as well, breathe basically, um, because it's covered in this sooty mold. But the sooty mold itself is is trying to consume the the honeydew produced by these insects and not the the leaves itself. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of a, a fungus insect interaction. This is the ash bolete. And you'll see these around ash trees. And um, if you're like me, your first thought is, oh, this must be mycorrhizal with ash trees. It must be beneficial um, for the tree. You know, it helps the tree absorb minerals and the tree provides it with some sugars. That must be what's going on here. Um, well, actually what's going on is there are these aphids that are feeding on the roots of the tree. And the fungus protects these aphids by growing tissue around them, um, a tissue called sclerotia, um, that houses these little aphids. And the aphids, like we just talked about, are producing honeydew by sucking on the sap through the roots. And the fungus is taking that honeydew and able to use that um, as sugars. Um, and so, um, and meanwhile, that sclerotia that the fungus um, has made protects these aphids from other predators that might be in the soil. Um, so I just think that's a really um, great interaction between plants, fungi, and insects. Um, okay, and now we're moving on to the ugly. Um, we're going to talk about parasitoids and entomopathogenic fungi. Um, so, um, let me back up and explain what a parasitoid is. Um, a parasitoid is different from a parasite in that a parasitoid wants to kill its host in order to complete its life cycle. So, um, a lot of, there are a lot of parasitoid wasps, um, you might've seen caterpillars covered in these white, um, these little white things, and that's the cocoons of a parasitoid wasp that are several parasitoid wasps that were feeding in a caterpillar. Um, and then eventually they all emerge, they spun a little cocoon, and then they'll emerge as tiny little wasps, and they'll find a new caterpillar to lay their eggs in. Um, that's an example of a parasitoid that kills its host. A parasite, for example, uh, could be like uh, a leech which, you know, isn't intending to kill its host. It's just sucking blood for a while and then it comes off and um, it got its blood meal, right? Um, so uh, Braconids are a type of parasitoid. These are tiny little wasps, much like the ones that might um, be a parasitoid on caterpillars, um, but they generally specialize on certain insect. So these are probably specialized on some type of beetle and they're on this fungus, presumably where there are beetles inside of the fungus and they are trying to find a way to lay their eggs um, either in that beetle larva or close enough to it that their, their young can um, parasitize it or be a parasitoid, eventually kill it and then emerge as, as an adult. Um, here is the stump stabber. Um, it's another parasitoid. Um, so this is a wasp as well. You're going to see its um, ovipositor come out of this log. Um, and they are looking for um, a different type of wasp. They're called horntail wasps um, to lay their eggs in. And so horntail wasps feed in wood. Um, and they do a similar thing to the ambrosia beetles. They inoculate um, the wood with fungi. And the way that these uh, parasitoid wasps, the stump stabbers, are finding their host is by smelling for that fungus because that fungus is so closely associated with their host. So um, they use their antenna and olfactory cues and they try to find a log that. Um, um, 
has been invaded with this fungus, and then they know that their um, host insect is inside that log, and then they'll use that long ovipositor, drill it into the wood, and lay an egg on or near that host for their young to um, eat and develop into an adult. Um, okay, and now we're going to talk about entomopathogenic fungi. Um, this is Ophia cordyceps unilateralis, um, and these were images taken in the big thicket the last time I, I visited. Um, and um, these are all carpenter ants that have been infected with this fungus. So they were walking around the forest floor, they came in contact with the spore, and the spore found its way through their cuticle uh, using enzymes and other other methods, and then it started to um, to grow inside of the ant. Um, eventually, it starts altering the ant's behavior um, when it's about time for it to develop a fruiting body. So, around that time, it it makes the ant climb, um, and it usually makes the ant climb to a specific height, and then once it gets to that height, it'll climb out to a branch or the underside of a leaf, um, and it'll have the ant clamp its jaws down, um, its mandibles, um, tightly to the underside of that twig or leaf or whatever it is. Um, and the reason it does it to a specific height is because um, the fungus is trying to get the right conditions, humidity, um, temperature, all these things, so that the fruiting body can, can grow more successfully. Um, and earlier I talked about how we know that, um, these fungi have existed for 48 million years. And the way that we know that is because when these ants clamp down on the underside of a leaf, they leave a very distinct pattern that is pretty much only left when ants clamp down on the underside of a leaf. And they would only ever do that in the case that they were infected with this fungus. And so... Um, scientists scoured all these leaf fossils from, um, you know, uh, millions of years ago, and they found um, leaf fossils from 48 million years ago that have that distinct um, clamp uh, pattern still imprinted on that fossilized leaf. And so that's how we know that this, this fungus has been doing that for at least 48 million years. Um, and uh, we're going to briefly talk about mimicry again, or crypsis kind of. Um, here is a um, tree hopper um, in the tropics. And it this is just a, an actual structure on the insect itself. So this is its pronotum. Um, but presumably, it has this look because it's mimicking um, having been infected by a fungus. And so Presumably, other insects might leave it alone, particularly ants. Um, if they were to come in contact with this insect, they might um, presume that it's been infected with a fungus and uh, leave it alone. Uh, this is another um, entomopathogen entomopathogenic fun fungus that I have seen more locally. So this was in the Barton Creek Greenbelt. Um, and this is Arthrophagia meriopodana. Um, and it might not be super clear, but in between the segments of this millipede, you'll see um, some kind of fluffy looking tissue coming out. And that is the fungus fruiting body. Um, and so this fungus acts very much in the same ways that the other one did. Um, but instead of clamping down its mandibles, the millipede will climb to a, a certain place and then it'll wrap around um, leaves or twigs or whatever in a way that um, it becomes attached as it dies. Um, and ants, they call it the death grip. I think probably the same in this case. Um, they become stiff when they die. And so they, um, you know, tend to stay on the plant for a long time in that way. Um, this is a Bovaria species. I'm not sure if Jeremy's on the call, but I think Jeremy is the one that spotted this one when we were on a form, 
foray in East Texas in the big thicket. Um, and uh, uh, Bavaria species can vary quite considerably. Um, here's another Bavaria species growing on um, a locust or a, a, some kind of orthoptera uh, cricket or grasshopper. Um, and there's metarhizium, uh, looks kind of similar to the, the wasp a couple of images ago, um, kind of covered in this white, um, almost like frosty fungus. Um, there's cordyceps militaris. This is one that probably most of y'all are familiar with, especially if you've um, come across um, medicinal mushrooms. Cordyceps has been uh, touted as, you know, this fantastic uh, medicinal mushroom. It's in a lot of um, medicinal, you know, mushroom coffees and, and matchas and tinctures and all that. Um, and in fact, you know, I implore y'all to, to look up William Padilla Brown and what he's done. He's learned how to grow cordyceps on um, substrates that aren't insects. So you don't have to, you know, uh, farm insects to farm your cordyceps. You can, you can grow them off of uh, rice and other um, things that you can just probably pick up at your grocery store. Um, uh, here's another cordyceps growing on uh, tarantula. Um, I just had to show some of these really bizarre ones. Um, and y'all should look these up too. There's so many and I just didn't want to uh, go on too long, but here's another cordyceps. Um, this is a different species altogether. Um, and then there's Massospora cicadina. Um, there's several species of Massospora. I wanted to end with this one just because it's so bizarre. Um, this one was showing up in the, the periodic cicadas emergence um, this last time. I can't remember how many years ago that was now, maybe two or three years ago. Um, and those cicadas um, only emerge every so many years. I can't remember. I want to say it's a 17-year cycle. Um, but um, this last time, people started noticing how uh, prevalent this uh, fungus was. Um, the fungus is on the abdomen here at the end of the abdomen. Um, and so basically some of these cicadas, when they emerge, they'll molt, they'll emerge from the ground, they'll molt, and they'll already have been infected with this fungus. And so pretty soon after molting, their, the hind end of their abdomen, basically their butt falls off. And then they've got this kind of plug of um, fungal tissue with spores. And, um, and then as cicadas tend to do, they're ready to mate. Um, and for whatever reason, this fungus actually turns up their sex drive. So they wanna mate more than just a regular cicada would, and they have more stamina, more drive to keep trying to mate, even though they can't actually do anything except you know mount other cicadas. And when they're doing that, they're spreading those spores. Um, and so uh, apparently males will even, um, males who are infected will even pretend to be females just to get other males to, to mount them and then they get infected that way. So they're spreading this, this disease. Um, and then even more bizarre, um, these fungi are flooding the cicada system with psychedelic uh, chemicals. So they found psilocybin in some of these um, and other psychedelic chemicals. Um, and so these cicadas are just um, like tripping and uh, going crazy trying to mate with others and just spreading the fungus. And it's just totally bizarre. Um, and so uh, <laughs> that's how I chose to end uh, the presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, next month, there is a talk on the epidemiology and management of oak wilt. Um, so we can learn and go into a lot more detail about that with uh, Dr. Demian Gomez. And um, we also wanted to do a trivia question. 
Um, and so, sorry, let me back up. Angel, do, do we just want to, how do we want to handle like? Yeah, so we could do uh, first person to answer the correct, first person, first correct answer in the chat. Um, in the chat. They win. Okay. And yeah, I just need your email. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll put this email I was... that uh, you need to send. Let me put that in there real quick um, before. We get Somebody might answers. have seen the question already. I'm sorry, I, I might have gone too fast through there. But <laughs> all right, so y'all ready? Get, get your chats open. All right. What is the fungus carrying structure of certain insects, like bark beetles and horn tails, called? Not sure. Angel, are you watching the chat? I'm watching. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Did I like, ask too difficult yeah. of a question? <laughs> ah. I mean, if if nobody answers it, I can come up with another question. Was it uh, mycangia? Yes. Oh yeah. So uh, we got a uh, the first person to answer correctly is um, and Marie Riviera Sanchez. Great. Yeah, I so mycangium right. or mycangia is that structure. Mycangium is singular, mycangia is plural. Um, Yay. Okay, so I just need your mailing address. Um, if you can just email it to the address above. And um, the, the pre orders just started, so it'll probably come like later in November, is my guess. Yay. Sure. All right, questions. We didn't, we got mostly comments flowing okay. in the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, feel free to unmute and ask questions. Yeah, great job, Chris. Thanks you so much. I'll also share, you know, thanks to Central Texas Mycological Society. If you're not a member and you're in our area, you definitely should become a member. There's lots of great perks. Um, and then here's um, my Instagram or website if you want to um, check those out if you're interested in learning more. All right. Any questions on YouTube? You can go look and see if there's any there. Yeah, none. No questions. Uh, hi, I had a question I typed in chat, but uh, I can say it in person. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, uh, for the cordyceps and like similar fungi species, do they ever form like larger super colonies outside of like individual insects? Um, can you explain what you mean by a larger super colony? Outside? Oh, like, I mean, like, I guess like, do the colonies just like, are they just only limited to like single insects and then they just spread to other insects or like, did they ever like form colonies like in plants and other species underground? Yeah, no, uh, these fungi are, are highly specialized for um, growing on specific insects. Um, clearly, every once in a while, um, they will just through, you know, evolution, um, create, they might create a spore that can all of a sudden take on a new host. Um, but that might be just another closely related ant or, you know, another insect altogether. They'll find their way through that cuticle and they'll find that it's a suitable place for them to grow. Um, and so that happens, you know, very randomly, uh, probably on a huge time frame, um, where every once in a while it mutates so that it can take on a new host. Um, but no, they're usually very specialized for growing only in a certain insect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Is this stuff gross or is it gross? Is that a comment or a question? <laughs> <laughs> that time of the year to get Um, Angel, I, one thing I was thinking about is like, if we have a good year for that, um, 
millipede fungus. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we could do some walks centered around um, yeah. showing people the millipede fungus. Um, would there be any interest in that from people? Feel free to say in the chat. Um, but yeah. Ron, yeah. did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so someone asks, is this recorded? So yes, it is recorded. It's on our YouTube channel. So smash that subscribe, subscribe button. Um, all of our um, talks are usually cataloged. So yeah, um, hand I know that um, we did find some of the some of the the millipede infected. Um, it was like in the winter, mm -hmm. winter time. I don't know if there's a specific time of year, but um, we'll have to look, keep a lookout for it um, tomorrow because that's where I first saw it, you know, doing and using the UV light since the exoskeleton absorbs the UV. It's a great, great tool to find them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, definitely keep a lookout for an insect fungi walk in the future. And thanks again for every uh, everyone for coming out Thursday night. And we'll see you next month for a talk on oak wilt. Awesome. Thank um, you. Yeah, I just need you to email your uh, mailing address to the info at centraltexasmycology.org.